Good morning. I'm excited to see all of you this morning that are here with the correct last name and last initial. And we are thankful to be here to lead you, all of you families that are still worshiping at home this morning, who uh, maybe have already had a turn to come to worship or who are awaiting their turn. But nonetheless, we are all excited to be worshiping together this morning, wherever you are. So I want to invite you to stand um, as we begin with all hail the power of Jesus' name. I want to invite you to worship with us this morning. One, two, three, four. for worship this morning. We are grateful that we have the means of technology to worship if we're in our homes this morning. We're grateful to be able to worship in our cars or wherever the rest of our friends and family and co-workers may be worshiping this morning. God, we know that where two or three are gathered, that you are there also, and so we know that you are with everyone who is worshiping this morning, and everyone that's opening their word to study what you have to say to us and whoever is worshiping through song. And so we pray that you will draw near to us, God, and speak to us through this time of worship. It's in your son's most holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's so great to see all of y'all and all the people that are here worshiping us, with, with us online. Um, I'm so glad to see each and every one of y'all. It's been such a long time. Whenever I was up here getting ready to see, I saw Nancy going. So it was so, it's so great to see all of y'all. Um, if you're a guest here with us, uh, whether physically here or online, uh, text that number, te text HBC to that number right there, and um, we'll welcome y'all through via text message. Um, um, so next, we're going to um, get a little children's video, get to listen to me again. So enjoy the children's, children's ministry video. 
Hey guys, happy Sunday. I hope y'all are having a fantastic Sunday so far. If you don't know who I am, my name is Miss Libby and I'm the interim children's minister here at Highland Baptist Church. And I have a special verse for y'all today. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. It says this, But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. Let me read that verse again. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. Okay, guys, so as you can see, I have ice cream in my hand, right? And my ice cream is kind of melted. So whenever I first got this ice cream, it was a big scoop of frozen gloriousness, right? Um, so this ice cream started growing weary because it started sitting out for a while. Let me read this verse again in my Bible. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. So God always wants us to do good, and he always wants us to strive to be our absolute best in everything that we do, right? God always wants us to, do, to try our absolute best in telling others about who he is. But whenever we grow tired and not tell as many people about how amazing God is, we're growing weary, and God doesn't like that, okay? So try and stay like a frozen ice cream cone. Try and stay in that glorious goodness where you can always tell others about Jesus and how amazing he is. Pray with me. Hey, God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all that you bless us with. God, I pray that you be with us as we just go throughout the rest of this day and the rest of this week, God. And I pray that we just, um, just stay so, so amazed in who you are, God. God, I pray that um, we just put our all into telling others about you and how amazing you are because, God, you are so amazing and everyone in this world needs to know it, God. God, I pray that you be with us as we go throughout the rest of this day, and I pray that we glorify you in all that we do. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to continue worshiping with us as we sing, I sing praises. Would you stand, please? I said it first. <laughs> Jinx, one, two, three. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, some of you are, you, you, you're out of the practice, aren't you? Nobody, you don't talk back to the TV like that when someone says uh, uh, good morning. You don't really shout that back to the TV, do you? Um, understandable. I am so glad that you're here. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that's where we're going to be this morning, wrapping up our series uh, called Tomorrowland, Facing a Future Without Fear. Um, and in the last few weeks, uh, we have gone through Paul's letters 
to the Thessalonians, uh, the first Thessalonian letter and the second Thessalonian. We're wrapping up today. And we have been encouraged by the Apostle Paul and by God's Word that we can face uncertain days because we know that Jesus will return just like he said he would. And when he does, he will make everything that is wrong with this world, he will turn it all back to making it right. Now, as you're turning, who remembers the movie, uh, the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day? All right? Now, I want you to watch this clip, but as you watch it, I want you to pay attention to the question that he asked at the very beginning. This is a super important question that we're going to look at this morning. So take a look at this clip. Let me ask you guys a question. What if there were no tomorrow? No tomorrow. That would mean there would be no consequences. There would be no hangovers. We could do whatever we wanted. Oh. That's true. We could do whatever we want. Ah! Hey, Phil, if we wanted to hit mailboxes, we could let Ralph drive. Oh, yeah. Stop. Hang on. It's the same thing your whole life. Clean up your room, stand up straight, pick up your feet, take it like a man. Be nice to your sister. Don't mix beer and wine, ever. Oh, yeah. Don't drive on the railroad track. Oh, Phil, that's what I happen to agree with. Sometimes I think you just have to take the big chances. I'm betting he's gonna swear first. So, what if there were no tomorrow? We can look at the news, we can see Facebook, people are living like there is no tomorrow. Would you agree with that? I would. In fact, uh, that is a, a great question as we look at our text this morning, because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, what we're going to look at in this final portion of Paul's letter, it deals with people, and these are Christians now, living like there is no tomorrow. So follow along with me as I read, starting in verse 1 there. It says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because you were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Living like there is no tomorrow is one of the signs, great signs, 
of spiritual unhealthiness and is both for the individual and for the church collectively if that is the way believers are living in the in the moments of as we're waiting for Jesus's to uh, Jesus to return is living like there is no tomorrow but what we're going to see today is that one of the wisest things that we can do is to live like there is a tomorrow as we wait for Jesus Paul is going to give us four spiritually healthy signs that should be evident and that can be evident in our life because of what Jesus has already finished on the cross. So this is sort of like a spiritual checkup that Paul's going to give us as he ends his letter. As we wait for Jesus' return, here are four spiritual signs or spiritual uh, healthy markers that should be evident in our life. Let's pray, ask God to help us understand his word and to glorify the Lord, and then we will continue on in our text this morning. Lord, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to come before your word. And we ask, God, that you would uh, magnify the work of Jesus in our midst this morning. Lord, that you would call us to a deeper and a more faithful walk with you this morning. God, that you would call those that do not know you, that you would call them from death to life this morning, that you would give them new life in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would walk us through your text because you are good. And Lord, we want to glorify you in this. And so we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the very first uh, spiritual uh, healthy sign or marker that a, a, a spiritually healthy believer and church has in its life is found in the very first three, uh, four words or so. And it's prayer is a regular habit. Prayer is a regular habit. Look at that. He says, finally. So he's ending his letter. Finally, brothers, and that's a collective brothers, generally talking about the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, pray for us. Say that with me. Pray for us. So that's his command, is pray for us. Now, Paul ends his letter like here like he does most of his letters. He asks for prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong and no shame in asking for prayer as long as we're asking for the right things, right? And in the right motivations. But so what does Paul ask them to pray for? What is the content of his prayer that he wants prayer for? Well, he says it in the very next part. Keep on going. That... The word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you. And number two, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. So the word of the Lord here, it's specifically speaking about the gospel. The context here is about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus left heaven and he came to save sinners like you and me. That's the gospel. And he asked here that the Thessalonian believers would pray evangelistically. That means that they would pray for the gospel to change people's lives, just like it had changed their life. He asked them to pray for him, to pray for his church planning team, to be unhindered when they go and share the gospel, and to pray that the gospel would take root and that it would spread quickly wherever they went. And when it did, that it would be recepted or it would be received, it would bring glory to the Lord honored to the, uh, it, uh, it, and be honored is what that means. So the question, question, or as we look at this, Paul, prayer for Paul's uh, mission, it's vital. And, and if, pr- if prayer was that vital for Paul's mission, guess what? It's vital for our mission in this world today as well. So do you pray for others to be saved? Do you pray for our missionaries around the world, for their work to be productive? If we aren't praying like Paul, then we sure aren't partnering with God in his mission in this world. So we need to make prayer a regular habit in our life. Does the name Reed Hastings ring a bell to anybody? Probably not. I didn't know who this was until uh, I read his story. But in 1997, Mr. Hastings was on his way back from uh, settling a debt from a heartless creditor when an idea of a new business just popped into his mind. Who was that cruel creditor? Blockbuster Video. (laughs) Do you remember those? Yeah. So... He, uh, they charged him $40 for losing the VHS cassette to Apollo 13. Frustrated, bewildered by the video renting industry's bureaucracy and all that it was uh, there to, to, to keep the renter in its place, he decided he would fight for the video rights of uh, renters everywhere. So he put his idea into motion, which eventually became 
Netflix. <laughs> so Netflix, when it began, was that you could rent the video through the mail, you remember, and you could keep it as long as you want. There, there were no late charges for keeping it a week or two or whatever. You could keep it as long as you want. Now, there's a lot of discrepancy with the story of if, if, is it actually true or not? It doesn't really matter, but the point the story makes is true. Discontentment often leads to action. Discontentment often leads to action. The reason why Paul would go halfway around the world and share the gospel and ask for prayer in sharing the gospel is because he is discontent with people not knowing who Jesus is. Does that lead you to pray? Does that lead me to pray? Is prayer a regular habit in our life because we look around us and we see that our, our, hopefully our souls, our spirits are in discontentment right now? And of all the chaos that's going on, does that lead us to not just jump on the bandwagon or whatever bandwagon you want to get on, but does that lead you to pray first? It should. A regular habit of prayer is a sign of a healthy believer, and that is also a sign of a healthy church. So we see that's the first one. There's a second one here, a uh, second sign uh, of a healthy Christian. Uh, preaching, number two, has a prominent place. Preaching has a prominent place. Look with me at verse 1 again. The word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Now, I feel like I just need to spend just a few minutes here, not because I'm a preacher and I want to talk about preaching. I'm going to save you from a preaching class. But there is a point that needs to be made here that I believe it was important for Paul and therefore it is vitally important for us as well. So I've already mentioned that the word of the Lord here is about the gospel, that Paul is talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But not only that, but for Paul, the transmission, the vehicle, the conduit of the gospel is most often the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's talking about most of the time. Yes, it is evangelizing, but what did he do? He went from city to city, from town to town, preaching the gospel. There would be no churches. We would not be sitting here right now if there were no preaching, faithful preaching of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, he simply wrote, But we preach Christ crucified. In the same letter, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming you to the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the message of every faithful gospel preacher. It is not how God makes you want to makes you feel good or, or some result that may happen one day in, 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 in heaven that you'll get to spend eternity with him. The message of the gospel, the message of the gospel preacher, what changes lives, what changes people's eternal address is not about your feelings. It's not where you're going to just spend eternity one day. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ dying, not just for your sins, but in place of you. It is a substitutionary message. It is the faithful preaching of the gospel that we need, not just from this pulpit, but as part of our daily walk with Christ, we need to be listening to faithful preachers of the gospel. I hope, I pray and I hope that I am not the only one that is feeding you the gospel. I pray, I really pray that. Charles Simeon, arguably one of England's greatest preachers of the 19th century, he had three goals in his sermon development and his preaching. And, and I adopt these goals. Most preachers do, uh, that you hear them usually through seminary at some point. But in every uh, sermon he would preach, every sermon he would write, every one that I try to, my prayer this morning was for you in this same way. Number one, to humble the sinner. A gospel message always humbles the sinner. It breaks down the proud. And so when we preach, when you hear preaching, you want that to happen. You want that to break down the proud. So it needs to humble the sinner. But it's not just about putting somebody in the mud. It's exalting the Savior as well. It's not enough just to say, hey, we're sinful people. We need a solution to our sinful problem. We exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we promote holiness, or we encourage, we help you, we, we point you in the way of living and following Jesus in a daily lifestyle. 
That's the three goals right there. So my question is, what place does preaching have in your walk with Christ? Is it only here for 25 minutes on a Sunday? That's a good place to start. But I want to encourage you, add more to your diet of preaching and what men of God are saying and the faithful preaching of God's word. Is preaching vital to your spiritual growth as an individual follower of Christ? I pray that it is because as the world continues to almost seemingly spin out of control, there will always be somebody that has an answer of something. How are you going to know what they're saying is true or not? Does it humble the sinner? Does it exalt the Savior? And does it encourage me and give me a way in how to live and follow Jesus in the midst of whatever's going on around me? That's faithful preaching. So preaching has a prominent place in the life of a healthy believer. Number three, producing is more important than consuming. Producing is more important than consuming. This is a, a, a this text you you've known now through Ephesians, through first, first and Second Thessalonians. Paul writes some pretty complex sentences. Okay, so <clears throat> and the one of the hardest things to do is to find where God is going with this and and make logical sense because Paul his the way he thinks is different uh, in that first century context than the way we think. Um, and so we're having to kind of retrain ourselves on how Paul thinks so we can follow logically what he's saying. Now, this one, you, as you saw, the first two uh, points that Paul was making, that was based off of one verse, okay? And then he fills that out in uh, verses 2 through 5. And we didn't look at that, but we're, we're going to look at right now is verses six, 6 through 12, a large chunk of Scripture. Now, follow along with me as I read it, because he's making one primary point, although he props it up in several different ways, he's making one primary point. He says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. But we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So what is happening in this, this is the meat of this chapter here. What is happening, or what has happened prior to this, is that Paul, either they had received a letter that was in Paul's name, uh, but forged, or they had misunderstood Paul's first letter. Whatever it is, there were people within the, Th the Thessalonian church that decided they took Jesus' uh, eminence as being immediacy, that Jesus literally is about to come light right now, like tomorrow. And so therefore, I'm just going to sit on my front porch and just wait. I'm just going to wait, you know. I mean, that's the more spiritual thing to do, right, is just to sit and wait for Jesus. But the waiting caused them, because it kind of, you know, kept going, that Jesus had not come yet. So if you're not working and you're only waiting, how do you eat? Comes in the other believers. The other believers now are having to not only work for their own food, but now they're having to work for the freeloaders who are not doing anything in a spiritual context of waiting for Jesus. And Paul comes in and says, hey, there are people who are idle among you. That word idle is unruly, uh, undisciplined. Um, uh, is people who, uh, this is not people who could not work, but people who refuse to work that Paul here is reprimanding. And in fact, in verse 11, he talks about really the motivation or what's happening of, of these, in these people's hearts and their lives. He goes further in verse 11, and he says that they're, they're not busy at work, but busy bodies. This is a Greek play on words, and it literally means working at nothing but working around. Here's how we would say it. And, and these are people who are minding everyone else's business but their own. 
Know anybody like that? <laughs> yeah, we all do. Now don't turn to your neighbor and say, is this for you? We, we know people like that, minding everyone else's business but their own. These were people who decided Jesus is coming really soon, so I'm not going to do anything. But since I have time on my hands to do whatever I want, these were people meddling in the affairs of other Christians that were the same people trying to, uh, to, to, to provide for the people not working. Talk about crazy. This is why in 1 Timothy, Paul uses the same word of idleness to, to connect with gossip. That these were not good-hearted people just waiting on Jesus to return. They were using their time unwisely. And so these people, even, uh, there are even Christians today, right, who rely on the generosity of other Christians so that they can have time to do whatever they want to do. And it's usually in some uh, twisted spiritual way of response that they will give you of why they don't work, why they don't use their time more wisely. And it's normally more destructive than productive, and therefore they become consumers of God's kingdom instead of producers in God's kingdom. And as we progress toward Jesus' coming back, there is this tension that we have to live between, between uh, God coming back and between working right now. Do we want Jesus to come back at any moment? Yes, we do. But we also work while we wait. We also continue to do what God has called us to do while we wait. We have to learn to live in this necessary tension. And one way that we can grow spiritually is to be a producer while we wait and not merely a consumer while we wait. Let me me point us to the fourth thing. spiritually healthy sign in the life of a believer number four is perseverance in doing good perseverance in doing good just jump down to verse uh, 13 if you would we're going to look at that one verse as for you brothers again that's the church in general brothers and sisters do not grow weary in doing good do not grow weary in doing good loving God and loving others by doing good to them is the exact opposite of living an idle life and meddling in the affairs of others. And and so Paul here encourages us, he encourages his readers to persevere in doing good. Doing good, it, it, it means literally to choose what is right and then do that. That's not always easy, is it? Why would Paul have to command them to, to not grow weary in doing good. Shouldn't we want to do good all the time? Well, yeah, we, we want to do good all the time, but that's not always the case. Paul commands us to not grow weary in doing good because guess what? Sometimes it gets tough to do good consistently. We grow weary in doing good, in choosing what is right. Choosing what is right and doing good is often not easy. And in fact, it involves a lot of risk, doesn't it? Yeah, it often involves us being very vulnerable toward people and in front of people. Why should we persevere in doing good? That's a good question. Well, because Jesus persevered in doing good and choosing what is right for you and me. That, that should settle it right there, right? Is that Jesus uh, persevered in doing good for everything. It cost him everything. He didn't give up. He stayed the course because it was right. Doing good, choosing what is right is risky because it will cost us something, doesn't it? It costs us to choose what is good, to choose what is right based on the person that we're serving, the the person that we're loving. But that's the gospel message, is that Jesus ultimately gave up heaven for a Roman instrument of torture and death, a cross so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins and live eternally with God who loves us unconditionally. It costs Jesus everything. Doing good, choosing what is right, it will cost you something. When everyone is doing one thing and yet God is calling you to choose what is right, do not grow weary in doing good. When it's easier to go with the flow on social media, do not grow weary in doing good. When others don't understand your stance for Jesus and justice, do not grow weary in doing good. 
Doing good is the serious and the consistent business of Christian ethics. God, at the baseline, wants us to treat others the way that we want to be treated. And we want people to treat us right. And so he calls us, do not grow weary in doing good. See, there are enough people out there living like there is no tomorrow, isn't it? And, but God wants his people to live differently, to live like there is a tomorrow. Why does he want us to live like that? Well, I think the hymn writer said it best. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, or because I know he holds the future. Say, say the last part with me. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Do you believe that? I hope so. Do you have that kind of confidence to face your tomorrow because you know that Jesus lives? Are you here today or at home and you're just not sure if you have that kind of confidence yet? Then I want to help you with that because Jesus does live and he is offering you a relationship unlike any other relationship that you have ever seen before or will ever experience again. It is a relationship not based on what you have done or what you haven't done, but it's all based on what he has already done for you. It's also a relationship that will result in your complete and absolute forgiveness of sins. That when God forgives you, he forgives you 100% because Jesus paid. He stood in your place and paid for every sin that was stacked up against you and God. Jesus paid for that. And all he asks in return is that you give him your life. That you give him your heart. That, that you turn from your sin and turn to God through what Jesus has done for you. And if you want to do that today... Um, I want to invite you to do that, uh, and, and for our in-person crowd, uh, the way that we're going to do that is if you want to make that decision to, to trust Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and this new relationship that he wants to have with you today, then we're not going to have a response time where you come down front, but I want you to find me after the service, okay? We'll put our mask on, we'll stand about six feet apart, and then we'll get to talk about Jesus and the gospel and you, okay? <laughs> so we can do that. Or if you're at home uh, and it's easier, then, uh, then just go to www.highlandbaptist.net, www.highlandbaptist.net, and there's a little green button at the top called Yes to Jesus. Um, if you'll click that button, then that will come to me and I will be able to uh, have a conversation with you over the phone. And so I want to invite you to do that. So church, how is your spiritual health? Are, are, are you spiritually healthy as you took this checklist, as you saw this? Is prayer a regular habit for you? What kind of place or what place does preaching have in your spiritual walk with Christ? Are you working for the Lord while you were waiting for the Lord? And are you persevering in doing good? Worship team, go ahead and come on up. Because as they come, I want to encourage you we're about to sing one of the greatest prayers ever in fact it's it's it is uh used several times through the the book of revelation and at the end of revelation it uses it three more times it is one of the prayers that every christian should ought to be praying especially during days like to like these days that we're in it, the the one word could be described as Maranatha. And if you know what that means, you know that it means come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. We know the world needs Jesus. So does Jesus. He knows that more than you. And the Bible says that, that he, is, he is patient with people because he doesn't want anyone to not have a chance to repent. He wants all people to come to repentance. So he is patient. But as he is patient, his people are still praying come Lord Jesus I'm going to open us up in prayer and then this song will be our prayer uh, this morning as our response as we cry out to God as we call out to God that we need him today as much as we do the next day and the next and the next that he would come Lord Jesus let's pray Lord we thank you for this morning and we thank you for what uh, you have shown us in your word and we pray Lord um, 
God, that you would continue to draw the lost to you, continue to uh, quicken our spirits, wake us up, wake uh, your church up, Lord, so that we would walk and follow Jesus as lights in the darkness. God, and may, may our prayer be that you will come, Lord Jesus, our sovereign God, the one who has defeated our foes. We ask that you would come, work in us, through us, and among us. And we ask this, and we sing, all in the name of Jesus. Would you stand and worship? All creation, lift the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is come. Don't have a seat. Stay standing. Um, just a quick few words uh, before we, we leave. Um, we want to thank you for being here this morning. Um, and uh, just if you haven't, uh, the boxes in the back as you go out by the doors, those are our offering boxes, okay? Uh, which you can place your offering there if you'd like to. But also, if you have deacon ballots, uh, deacon elections right now are going on. Um, and so uh, drop those also in that box. Uh, we will not probably be handing the deacon ballots out, but they are on the box. Uh, we're trying not to hand stuff out to you personally, okay? Um, but those are on the box. If you need a ballot, then you 
you can take that um, prayerfully consider. Please read over what the biblical qualifications of, uh, of uh, deacons are. Um, God has given us those, and, and we want to be able to follow what uh, his prescription for that is. So um, prayerfully consider uh, who God is uh, calling to be both new deacons uh, and, and uh, returning uh, deacons as well. So make sure you do that. Um, am I forgetting anything else? You don't think so? Okay. All right. I have to look to the leader over here. So, <laughs> look, we, we, we want to thank you again for being here. Um, look forward to seeing all of you at home next week. Uh, and I want to finish up uh, our study in Second Thessalonians. By the way, uh, next week we start a new series, Top Ten Psalms. Um, anybody care to take a guess on number 10? You're probably wrong, but go ahead. So, I, I didn't know this was number 10, but I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to wait till next week. Um, all right, so our benediction is going to come from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, I'm going to do 13 and then 16 and, the, and 18. Um, as for you, church, do not grow weary in doing good. Verse 16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and every way. The Lord be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Grace and peace. We love you. You are dismissed.